Hello, everyone. Welcome to Gardens and Grub All Things Food. I'm your friend Sherilyn Berry, extension agent here at the beautiful downtown office in Durham Extension Office. Um, we are going to talk about a really fun ingredient that you have definitely had at least one of these before. Um, but before then, um, just to let you know, if you'd like to, answer, to ask a question, um, please raise your hand, message us in uh, in Facebook or um, right in the chat box in Zoom. So, okay, we today are going to talk about a family called Zingiberaceae or Zingiberaceae. It can be pronounced either way. This is C or CA. And these are always like families like Brassicaceae and um, you know, things like that. Um, so this is a, a, a species name. It'll be genus and species. And so this is a family. And it includes ginger, and it includes turmeric, and galangal. So we're going to talk about all of these today. Um, it also includes cardamom, uh, but cardamom is much is very complex, and uh, it gets its own um, week. And so we're going to do uh, we're going to do that next week so that we can kind of continue on with this family um, but we have enough time to talk about all of the uses and species in this um, in this family so uh, ginger is the one that everybody knows best here in the u.s um, we actually use this in a lot of sweet applications um, where when we use ginger it's for you know it's a warming spice we use it for like cookies around the holidays or gingerbread houses or um, carrot cake things like that. But ginger actually um, was developed by Austronesian peoples. It was, it was not developed. It was this variety was developed basically, um, but it was domesticated by Austronesian peoples. And this is just like when we we're talking about onions and garlic being traded all over the world because of their storage capacity. Same thing with ginger. This whole family is in Zingiberaceae. It can, it's basically can stay good for like a year at room temperature if you keep it in the dark. Um, in fact, this is alive. So you can use this as a seed to make another plant if you like. Um, you'd want to break this apart. Oops. You'd want to break this apart into pieces, but we'll talk about how to plant this and maintain these kinds of plants. Um, you'd have to keep them very warm. Um, but this is ginger as we know it. This is called a hand of ginger. Um, when I buy ginger, I try to buy ones with long pieces and not too many of these little nodes. Um, the nodes are great if you're going to use it as planting because every node is going to give you a, another plant. This is where it's going to sprout. Um, but uh, when you're using it for culinary purposes, if you're trying to chop it or um, peel it, it can be a little bit um, uh, tedious to do the little pieces, but this is a nice big hand of ginger. So um, very lovely. Um, it's usually planted in tropical regions. All of this family, are, they, they basically grow between 68 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Some of them can grow a little bit hotter, um, but this guy doesn't even like being at like 55 degrees. So it is so frost sensitive, not frost tolerant at all. And if you wanted to grow anything in this family in North Carolina, it would need to probably be container grown in a greenhouse if you wanted to do it year round, or you could grow it as an annual, basically from like March or April, you can start it in the house. And then when it's hot and humid outside, you can put it outside and then bring it back in, um, in the winter. And then you can probably harvest it then and then keep some of it for, um, for replanting the following year, but you have to keep it warm and it likes a lot of light. So real quick, let's look at some of the flowers of these because most people think, oh, you know, ginger, uh, you know, it's just grown this. A lot of times people don't know even what this plant looks like because this is a rhizome that grows under the ground. So in the case of galangal, I can show you that this grows, it's not a ginger root and it's not a galangal root and it's not a turmeric root, it's a rhizome. What that is, is a creeping underground stem. And you can see this in some of the centipede grasses that grow around here. You've got, you know, when you go to pull a weed, and you pull it and it goes boop, 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 and, there, and there's this kind of thing that's chasing along the ground where all the grasses are coming out of it. That's exactly like a ginger plant or anything in this family grows that way. So if you see on the galangal, there's all of these little points here. That's where the roots came out. These little spindly roots come out. This grows directly under the soil by, by a couple of inches. And then everywhere where you see these sort of scabs here, these dry parts, that's where the plants came out and the flowers bloomed. So um, let me show you some of those flowers. 
these are all ginger flowers that I'm about to show you, but there are thousands of varieties of ginger. Um, these are just a few that are really beautiful. So this one most likely that was harvested for the store had a flower that looked like this. Um, basically it's this sort of like, almost like a pine cone inside of here. And these little flowers sprout out of here. And if you pluck these, you can actually turn them around and suck on them and get the nectar out of the bottom. You can also put these on top of salad. This is beautiful to have on a salad, very fancy. Um, another one that's my favorite, that's the most common that I've seen as an ornamental ginger um, is this one right here. So this is beautiful. Anywhere you drive in the tropics, if you go anywhere in the tropics, whether it's like, um, you know, anywhere in island Asia or Polynesian island of any kind, you will see this ginger growing because it's basically indestructible. So um, if you just put your nose up to this, it doesn't smell like anything, but if you run your hand over it like a pom-pom and smell it, it smells like when you open up a fresh box of like tricks or Fruit Loops, it smells like fruit candy. Oh, it's so beautiful. Um, also any of these cut flowers like this that don't have this guy, doesn't last as a cut flower as well, but this guy will last for three weeks, almost a month in cut flowers if you change the water every day or two. So really, really beautiful. And if you can see the leaves here, it has the opposite leaves that come out. Um, the leaves smell good. And also um, they'll use these to um, help wrap like meats when they bury them in the ground to cook them in an emu in, in Hawaii, at least. Um, and also um, they will use them. You can wind these up and make necklaces out of them. Um, you can weave them into hats, mats. Leaves are used a lot in um, like, if you go to any island culture, you're gonna see mats that people sit on that are made out of leaves, hats that people wear that are made out of leaves. And um, there's lots of leaves that they use, but this is one of them is, is the ginger leaf because it's very common. Um, here's one that I love. Um, this is called awapui ginger. Now awapui just means ginger in Hawaii, um, in, in ancient Hawaiian language. Um, but actually this is called shampoo ginger. So if you squeeze this, there's sort of this like gooey exudate that comes out of it, like a sap. And it's very moisturizing and emollient for hair and skin. So um, a very, I think it was like Paul Mitchell in the eighties, they, they have like um, purple packaging and everything smells like grapes. Um, that was real popular in the eighties. I think it was Paul Mitchell or Aussie or something. I don't know. They still sell it in the stores. Um, they call it awapui. Um, and all that is is shampoo ginger. So in indigenous um, Hawaiian culture, um, you would bathe, you know, by a stream or a waterfall. And then you take these and you squeeze them and you kind of do like a, a body conditioner and a hair conditioner with these. So really delicious and they smell fantastic. Um, this one is one of the most beautiful um, uh, ornamental gingers and it's called torch ginger. So this one, you can also squeeze on these petals and they smell good. All of these gingers um, you can eat the root of them. Um, I'm sorry, the rhizome of them. So they're all edible gingers. It's just some of them are grown more for the flowers and leaves and some are grown, um, you know, every single one is beautiful though. And in fact, galangal flowers and turmeric flowers look kind of similar as this guy does. So just to let you know, when you see this formation of like this kind of pine cone with stuff coming out of it, um, whether it's petals or individual flowers, you can almost bet it's a ginger. So, um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about, um, well, some of the health benefits of ginger. So um, all of these in this family have been used in um, Ayurvedic med medicine and Chinese medicine for thousands of years. So Ayurveda is like uh, India's um, alternative med medicine system. It means knowledge of life. And it's sort of like a lifestyle. It's like you eat your medicine every day, you meditate every day, you do this sort of life practices to keep yourself healthy and have longevity through your life. Chinese medicine is very much the same, a lot of use of herbs and things like that. Modern medicine looks at all of these systems, because there's other systems in, um, you know, Hindi culture and, um, but this family of, of plants is used in all of those um, because they're Asian cultures, uh, but um, modern medicine looks at this as quackery. Um, so it's really, you know, it, it, this is a cultural food and, and cultural uses, and there's value in that. Um, whether or not these things are being studied for their benefits, not really. So um, there's sort of some differing evidence uh, on, especially for the use of ginger for digestion. It's very well known in the alternative medical world, uh, you know, the ones we just spoke of, um, for uh, digestion. So whether you have, you know, you ate something that caused your stomach to be upset, 
this can settle your stomach. If you feel nauseated, you boil this in a tea, it can settle your stomach. If you have something like you ate something and it feels like it's not moving through you, you can make a tea out of this and drink it. So um, that works in those medical systems. And personally for me, um, anytime I have any problem digestive wise, unless it's heartburn, not for heartburn, because it is spicy, it's, it's its own kind of spicy, but any of the aforementioned problems, I use this sort of as a general body tonic. Um, but has it been studied for, it has been studied for nausea and chemotherapy and in pregnancy. And some studies indicated that it benefited people and other studies said that it really didn't. So they say that, you know, from a meta analysis, it's not a statistical significance, but hey, it can't hurt you. So if it works for you, go ahead and use it. Plus it tastes delicious. Here in the US, we think of this as like something we add to sweet things, but throughout the world, um, this is used in a lot of like curries and pickle. And I mean, pretty much all the Asian cuisines, um, just ginger is used all over the place. Um, when we use it in Europe, um, like if you've ever watched the Great British Bake Off or Great British Baking Show is what we call it here, they'll talk about when they describe their um, recipes that they're doing, they'll say, oh, I'm doing A, B, and C, and I'm using stem ginger. We call this candy ginger in the US. And basically you take ginger, you slice it thin, and you cook it in sugar syrup and then once it's totally saturated with sugar syrup, you drain it and then you coat it in kind of a thicker sugar. And it's it's a delicious treat. I love this as like a digestive after a meal, eat a couple of little pieces of ginger, it freshens your breath, um, gets a little kind of stomach fire going. I, I love it, I think it's great. So I always have this, this is an ingredient I always have in my house. If I wanna do like a quick scone or something like that, if someone's coming over for breakfast, well, we'll do that again in the before times and after times. Uh, I, I always have some sort of dried fruit and candy ginger, and you can fold that into a biscuit dough um, and you know any biscuit dough and, and it, cut it into a triangle, brush the top with cream, and all of a sudden you have a scone instead of a Southern biscuit. So just a nice ingredient to have around um, for an ingredient, but also for like a little sweet something after a meal. Okay, so why don't we go from uh, ginger to turmeric? So turmeric is one of the current sort of uh, superfoods. Um, we always have uh, sort of, I call them devil foods and angel foods. Um, there'll be like a new thing that comes out that it's just all the rage and everybody's doing it. 20 years ago in the West, it was kale and goji berries. Um, 30 years ago, it was oat bran and wheat germ. Um, and, you know, 10 years ago, it was probiotics, you know, the kombucha and the um, yogurt and things. Um, and now we're into things like uh, curcumin, which is the active ingredient in um in turmeric. So this is turmeric and it has been used again thousands of years in um, lots of traditional medical systems. This does have some um, benefit. All this whole family is very rich in antioxidants. This one especially, turmeric especially, I mean, you can just tell because of that color. I mean, it is just, uh, just this will, they use it to dye clothing in India. And in fact, um, if anyone has ever seen like Buddhist monks robes, um, you know, think of the Dalai Lama and he wears sort of like maroon and gold, the gold one, I'm sure they probably, he probably wears modern dyed clothing now, but that gold color is traditionally done with turmeric. Um, it's not the best clothing dye. It will dye and stain the clothing, but if you wash it and lay it out to dry, it will eventually bleach it. It's not, um, color fast to the sun. So it will, the sun will eventually bleach it. So you'd have to dye it again. This is also used in wedding ceremonies all across the world. This is really beautiful in Asia. Um, some cultures will tie little bits of this around their wrist when they get married. Um, women often will, uh, paint their faces with it. Um, it's supposed to be like, make your skin glow and, but it will stain your skin bright yellow. So I don't recommend it as a mask because unless you have a couple of days off because it will have to wear off of you. Um, but this is very rich in antioxidants and it's an anti-inflammatory. This whole family is an anti-inflammatory, um, but this one in particular. So right now people are, uh, rather than eating it in food, because in the US we don't really use turmeric in food, uh, in cuisines, in American cuisine, you won't find this unless it's a food coloring. So sometimes you'll find if you look on a um, uh, ingredient list, it'll say turmeric oleoresin or turmeric. Um, and that's because they can add a very small amount of this 
and it will turn mustard bright yellow. So, or they'll use it to color like rices and things that instead of saffron. So if you've ever had saffron, saffron, we'll have to do that during a week because it's the most expensive spice in the world. And I'm fascinated with it. I really want to grow saffron crocuses at the garden, but I'll tell you all about that later. Um, this also dyes things that beautiful golden orange color. So, um, and it's much, much cheaper by the pound than, um, than high quality saffron. So this is often used in like saffron rice and um, other things that need to turn yellow. Sometimes it's used in American cheese. Um, it has sort of a, it's not as spicy as ginger, but when you smell it, you can tell that it's related to ginger because it has some of those same flavor notes, but it has an earthier smell to it. And there's like kind of an earthy and a peppery note to it that um, is not in ginger, but it is not as spicy. Um, this one is like, it's very difficult to break ginger. Like you can break off the smaller pieces. This is incredibly fibrous, but turmeric really is not fibrous at all. Um, this is also used as an acid-based indicator. So you can see this if you make like, I'll make tea out of this. I'll slice up a little bit of this and a little bit of this and boil it for about a half hour and then strain it. And it'll be, you know, it's, it's going to be this color orange. And then you squeeze a lemon in it and it turns bright yellow, like, like a light golden yellow rather than this orange. And so they use it as an acid base indicator, which means like if something is um, alkaline, it will be this color. And if you add acid to it or a solution is acid, it will be closer to this color. So anyway, just a fun little chemistry note for you. Um, and last but definitely not least is galangal. So this, the reason that I was inspired to do this week on uh, galangal is my, or on, on the Zingiberaceae family, is that one of my friends, um, Jake Royal at our garden, he's a fabulous volunteer, asked me if I knew where to get uh, blue ginger to grow. And I thought, I've eaten all these different types of ginger and cooked with them. I've never heard of blue ginger. And so I started looking into it and he's actually talking about galangal. So you can grow this, you're gonna grow this the exact same way that you're gonna grow turmeric and the, how you're gonna grow ginger. Um, it grows the exact same way. Um, if you are gonna grow it, you need to make sure that you have sort of a wider container that's shallower rather than a deep container because it won't grow like this. It grows parallel to our sort of field of gravity that's pulling down. So, um, and then so that the shoots can go directly upwards. But this is where those beautiful leaves came out, those stalks. Um, one little joke about uh, gingers in general, this family, but especially this guy, is in the tropics, you know, there's this joke that like, if you don't like somebody or wanna get back at a neighbor, you take a chunk of ginger and you throw it on their land and it will sprout if it's the right place, it will sprout. And it's sort of like bamboo here. Um, bamboo grows and, and, and spreads the same way. It, it's it's it very much the same growing habit. Um, it's impossible to get it out. Like if, it, if this is in a tropical climate and it gets established, you need like a backhoe to get it out. Because if you just leave this much in the ground, it's gonna come back again and again. So it's very, it can be really invasive. So you have to be careful, not here in North Carolina because it'll freeze back and die, but not in a place where it never gets over 90 degrees and never gets under 65. You're stuck with that ginger forever. <laughs> anyway, this is Galangal. And if you break off a piece of this, Oh, it's very, very fibrous. In fact, you wouldn't grate this to eat it. Um, this is, if you've ever had tum ka, which is a um, coconut soup um, common in, uh, in Thai cuisine. It's a white soup and it usually has vegetables and whole chili pods, um, ginger and galangal um, sliced up in there. If you have, you've, if you've tasted tom ka before, you will recognize the smell and taste anywhere um, because that's one of the dominant flavors in it. It's like ginger. It's a little spicy like ginger, but it's grassy, peppery, and it smells like there's pine needles in here. Like it's related to like a pine forest a little bit. It's really nice. Um, you can also find these in a lot of curries, things like that. So a lot of Indian cooking, Chinese cooking, um, South Asian cooking, you'll find galangal. This thing is very heavy and it's very woody. So um, while you might slice this up and flavor something with it, you would probably pull it out before you serve it or you would eat around it in a bowl, kind of like in the Tom Ka. A lot of times you'll get the bowl of soup and it'll have these whole chilies in it. Some people will munch right down on those. I eat around those because um, depending on how hot the chilies are that they put in there, I want the flavor of the chili, but I don't necessarily want to get um, hot things stuck in my teeth uh, for my next course to come along. So um, if you get the chance to try Tom Ka, it's T-O-M, 
K-H-A, Tom Ka. Um, and it's a really common, you go to any, um, any Thai restaurant and they're going to have that in their soup list. I highly recommend that you try it so that you can get kind of what the flavor of this is. It's really beautiful. All right. So since it's about 10 minutes, we got about 10 minutes left. I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. You can ask me about the Zingiberaceae family, or you can ask me about anything food wise. And I'd love to answer your questions. All right, guys, any questions out there this week? Do we have a quiet group? We have a quiet group. This is this is interesting. Um, let me check our Facebook friends and see. Otherwise, they're going to have to get my questions, um, <laughs> which I, I know are very good, but um, they always are. I just have a loves ginger comment on Facebook. So, um, well, my question is what I was asking you about before we started is the the most effective if you're picking one herb to take care of your health, to take every day, what, what would you take? One herb or spice, I guess. Well, I would sooner eat it rather than take it. So I wanted to show you that really quick. Actually, there's a great question leading into this because I forgot to show you this. Turmeric is, should be this color. If you're gonna buy turmeric, uh, make sure you're getting it from a reputable source um, somewhere, like especially if it's dried like this, um, because if you're getting it like real cheap online, and it's coming from India or China, it could be contaminated with um, uh, red ochre dye, lead dyes, things like that. So um, you'll wanna get it, like there's a, quite a few American, Canadian and European countries that sell um, turmeric, but they buy the raw stuff, dry it and grind it. So just make sure that you're checking on that. Um, but the two I would probably do would be garlic and turmeric, cause turmeric is, very nutritious. It's very antioxidant, but that's really hard because there's just so many beautiful things, you know, that like if I had to reduce it to, I, I think if I had to pick one, it would be garlic because no matter where I was in the world, um, if I was stranded on a desert island, garlic makes things edible. So, you know, <laughs> you could, because <laughs> it isn't just the nutrition part of it. It's like the pleasure of food as well is very important. So another thing to consider is people will take turmeric pills and also make sure that you're getting these from a reputable source and that they're this color. So um, if they're like bright yellow or if they're kind of red orange, you're going to be a little bit concerned. But there's plenty of reputable companies out there that sell this as a um, as a, a supplement. Um, or what you can do is just have a shaker of it like salt on your table. So like if you're having some rice, put some turmeric on it. If you, you know, are making a smoothie, throw a little turmeric in there, you know? So it's just like, it's more the antioxidants and the pigments that are really beneficial to us. The phytochemicals sort of how we're always talking about, like the, the pigments of fruits and vegetables have their own, not necessarily traditionally nutritive quality, but antioxidant and um, health preventative, um, you know, cancer preventative, things like that kinds of qualities. So, yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have a question from the audience now, um, which is interesting. It is, do you recommend garlic for pregnant women? You know, when it comes to pregnant women, it's what they want. When women are pregnant, you give them whatever they want. There's, you know, I mean, uh, barring drugs and alcohol, you know, you, if, if, if mom wants garlic toast, she can have it, you know, it's, it's a food thing. So, you know, there's um, nothing wrong with it. There, there are some issues though. I mean, there's sort of taste and smell issues a lot of time that happen with pregnant people. They will smell something that used to smell delicious and be absolutely disgusted by it, you know? Um, especially during their first trimester when, um, when uh, morning sickness is, is a thing. Um, whereas in second trimester, third trimester, they're going to have different kinds of cravings. So, you know, when my mother was pregnant with me, she would just eat tomatoes and watermelons. Like she would just slice the end off a watermelon, sit on the floor, like crisscross applesauce and just eat a whole watermelon. So, you know, and I love both of those things now. So who knows? Um, one thing to con be concerned with, however, is um, heartburn. 
Um, a lot of times as the baby's growing, it will um, press on your vagal nerve, which is here in, you know, that kind of follows along your digestive tract um, and it can cause heartburn um, and cause the, uh, the little um, sphincter that you have at the top of your stomach to open up and give you heartburn. And so garlic probably isn't the best thing at that time. Um, ginger would probably be better at that time um, because it's going to be soothing and, um, you know, uh, burping a little bit of ginger is not near as bad as burping garlic or onions. Um, now for breastfeeding women, it's a little bit different. Anything that you take in, in, you know, you're basically the milk that you create is you breaking down your body and turning it into proteins for, for your child. So breastfeeding is great for moms right after, and it's not only great for baby, but it's great for moms right afterwards, because any of that baby fat that you had, um, you're actually using it and it's coming out in your milk. So women who tend to breastfeed tend to lose baby weight faster because you're literally reformatting your body into food for a baby. So, um, but if you eat a lot of garlic and onions, um, it will come out in your milk. Like you'll taste it and smell it. And um, the baby might be fine with that or the baby might not be fine with that. Um, I think it just depends on how much they've been exposed to it if you ate a lot of it. So, um, so for pregnant women, fine. Um, but for lactating people, um, you know, it, it just, it just depends on you, but yeah, again, pregnant people give them whatever they want. They're making a baby. They're Kings, Queens. They're, you know, they're everything. So <laughs> they're royalty. <laughs> Thank you, Sherilyn. We have another question coming in. Um, so if, how long can ginger grow? In other words, is it less tasty if it gets bigger and longer? That is a great question. So um, when it's more about rather than the size, the time of harvest. So, you know, if you're starting, say you're growing it as an annual, like how we are here, you would probably start this, like, you know, go to the grocery and get some organic, um, uh, ginger because the organic ginger is smaller. It has a lot more nodes and it hasn't been irradiated. We were talking about irradiation. You can pass this by cesium 137 or cobalt 60 and it'll prevent it from sprouting, extending its shelf life. So if you go and get organic, organic foods can't be irradiated. So they will sprout easier. Um, so just leave them like on, in a sunny, not a sunny, direct sunny window, but like a sunny window where it gets a good amount of sun and it'll start sprouting. And then you can just plant it and then it will grow and it'll start to like die back around October, November after you've brought it into the house. And at that point, um, you're going to harvest it, dig it up and, um, and it'll be perfect at that time. Now, if you left, if you left it in the ground, like if you're in the tropics and it's perennial and you left it in the ground until December, January, and you're trying to pull it out of there, it's not going to be as tasty. But if you left it in the, till March, April, it's all going to sprout again. You basically just left it in the ground. Um, so it's really good to let it grow and expand for that six, seven months and then harvest. And you've got these like big, delicious, juicy hands of garlic or I'm, I'm sorry, not garlic, ginger or um, anything in this family, uh, you know, like a six month, seven month growing period is perfect. Um, but if you're in an area that's warm, as long as usually in um, tropical regions, the winter time is the rainy season. Um, that's just generally speaking, there's lots of of different regions. Um, but the winter time is the rainy season and that's not the best time to harvest it. You want to get it before then. So, um, but you know, pretty much you could just leave it in the ground. And then, you know, even if you have a good stand of, of, um, ginger, cause these stands get really big. I mean, think of the bamboo that you see around North Carolina, very much like that. It'll get thick like that. You just go out there any time of year and dig it up really. I mean, cause it's always there. You can't get rid of it. So you might as well, you know, rather than trying to like keep it refrigerated or keep it, you know, just go out and harvest it. It's sort of like having an herb garden, you know, you don't need to buy bay leaves. If you have a bay leaf tree, you just walk out there and yank one anytime, you know, and it's always going to be good. So. All right. Do we have any more from the audience before I ask my final question? All right. Well, I think it's, it's nice for us to end because it's such a sunny day with you telling us what we should be doing in our gardens right now. Okay. Lettuce, peas, root crops, like, uh, um, beets, uh, you'd put chard in right now too. Um, rutabagas, uh, you put in turnips, radishes, um, anything with like a leafy top, an edible leafy top. 
Um, any of those things are going to be great right now. Um, you can even do spinach and things, but spinach is kind of, you know, you, you could put in some cilantro. I kind of like to overwinter that. Um, but any of the kind of leafy greens, collards, kale, um, if you can get some starts of kale at like your local store or whatever, great to go into the ground now. Um, yeah, because it's starting to get warm. We're going to have some cold, awful days, but you're going to get stuff that's kind of frost tolerant. And for your lettuces, if they come up on a warm day like this, just cover them with like a little sheet or something if it's going to freeze at night and they'll be fine and you could just take them off in the daytime and um and and they'll be absolutely fine and then you know come a month two months from now you have these big beautiful heads of lettuce so that's what i would do <laughs> that's Very what i already did <laughs> <laughs> well it looks like we are out of questions and out of time again this week awesome. thank you Sherilyn. well thank you everyone join us next week and we will continue this family into cardamom cardamom gets its own time because it's it's a whole ball of wax so we'll see you next week <laughs>